Hello and welcome to another episode of the Game Dev London podcast. You are blessed with two hosts today. Uh, I'm your first host, Roxanne Marshall. You can refer to me as she, her, and I'm joined by... Hello, I'm Stuart Deville. You may have seen my face before. (laughs) And you can refer to me as he, him. Today, we are chatting about our experience of managing different projects to switch careers and switch industries um, and how you can use your connections and sometimes unpaid experience to get where you want to get to. Um, I'm personally in, in the early stages of this trying to switch into the game industry, which I've been doing for a couple of years. Um, but Stu has already done that, so is a, a good person to talk to about it. So it would be good to kick off by giving us a little bit of a background of how you did it about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, um, I started out my career largely in in the creative realms in general. Um, I have done literally any creative job that I could find. (laughs) Um, So I've done like theatre and set design. I've done um, music. Uh, I've worked for an independent music magazine to do their design and layout. I design layout editor for them. Um, I've even done like graffiti workshops uh, to teach kids graffiti after after teaching myself graffiti. Um, and I've done, I've been a graphic designer, been a web designer, uh, anything design, I was just absolutely happy to do. Um, I've done book illustration, um, had that book published and, um, and I've done fine art. Um, I did a fine art collaboration with another fine artist and we put our, um, artwork all over the world. We went and did a campaign that covered uh, Paris, Berlin. So literally anything that I could do in the creative realm, I would, I, I tried to do because I love being creative. Um, and it wasn't until I found game development that I realized there was so much more creative uh, outlet in game development than, than there is in any other artistic form that I've uh, played with and mostly when you do these like more corporate um creative roles there's always someone who's saying i like what you've done but could you rein that in could you can we do it this way and most of the time as an artist you're going oh, yeah sure i can make it dull and boring and appeal to the masses sure um but yeah once i once I found, and, and the way that I found game development, weirdly enough, was through Blender, um, because, uh, and Blender first hit my radar as a 3D rendering software tool. Um, and I was like, oh, that's something I could do, I could get my teeth into. And I started playing around Blender. And at the time, Blender had uh, a couple more functions than it does right now, um, in that I realized I could create 3D models, I could then uh, rig those 3D models so that I could animate those 3D models. And at the time, Blender had a game engine um, that they've since scrapped because it was not great. But it was from that perspective that I was like, ooh, I can make computer games. (laughs) I can do Um, that. Yeah, I can do it all by myself right here. Because they're um, like now, for all of you guys who are alive and kicking right now, There's there's quite a lot of ways to get into game development. There's there's a few clear paths, although still mostly, as we're talking about today, it still mostly is a wiggly path into games. But um, yeah, ten years ago, um, realistically, the only courses that existed were if you went. I think there was a school that you could go to in America, um, if I remember correctly, and there was like a couple of adverts on TV about working in games, but they were very like scammy and I didn't want to touch this <laughs> but there wasn't this like I didn't there was no game development at my school there was no game development at any college um, or university at, when I was coming up um, so although it had been something that as, as someone who was a gamer and loved games 
like I would have loved to have been able to get into making games earlier on. Um, I never knew of a part. So this kind of just highlighted this whole world for me. Um, and from there, um, I, I just became obsessed with like trying to do it myself, trying to figure it all out. And uh, and then I discovered that there are communities of people who are like indie developers and hobbyist developers. And that led me to, to where I am now, basically. Um, running and hosting events for other game developers and being being as big a part of the community as I possibly can. So yeah, that was my kind of squiggly wiggly journey in. How have you found now, yourself? It is hard. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, it was in the first, second or third lockdown of 2020. It was around the, the December time. And I was thinking about my life and my career and I think we were all scrambling to find what made us happy and how we could bring that into everything we do yeah. and I actually started playing RuneScape again which for anyone who plays RuneScape since I was 13 I've pretty much played it on and off you you can't leave you never leave it always brings you back and I started playing RuneScape and I was like oh, I'd love to rip work for RuneScape uh, for Jagex and I was like wait I'd love to work in gaming. Like, why the hell have I not done this before? And started just like blank applying for jobs and building a bit of a network on LinkedIn, which is how we met. Mm -hmm. But I think I, I read from Sterling Reams, I think is how you pronounce his name. He said something recently that was just like, it's not enough to just love gaming to get into the industry. And from then I kind of started to find how I can get into the industry without being in the industry and gain that experience, which is how we've obviously ended up working together on Game Dev London and podcasts and um, now with Fribbly Games as well. But I think it took me too long to realize that you have to put in a bit of extra work and, and do that, you know, on a volunteer basis and also take up some of your free time. It, it, it's hard, like you have to be prepared to to take that time out of your day if if it's what you really want and that's the same for any industry right mm -hmm. if you yeah. want to be an athlete or it doesn't really matter if you want to be in film you, you have to take that time and and really dive into it if it's what you really want to do but um when you were at the beginning of it what sort of projects were you taking on to to get to where you are now um so initially way too many <laughs> but i mean that as, as people get to know me, they, I think they kind of realise that that's my, my raison d'etre. <laughs> I just, um, weirdly enough, one of, one of the projects that I started doing for experience, I'm still doing now. Um, and we've just hit a um, stage where the demo is going out and um, the, the fruits of that project, which has been five years at this point for me, um, look like they're on the horizon so there's lots of stuff like that in the games industry where you kind of have to take a bit of a, a bit of risk and you just have to dive in on a project especially in the indie game space there are so many studios that live and die um and, and but it's also where there's the most opportunity um so i know quite a few people that work for like one or two of the newer studios that have popped up because a new studio means new opportunities. Um, it means that you get to have like a bit of a proving ground. And it, even if the studio doesn't go on to do well, you can, um, A, you can learn stuff and B, you can show what your impact was, whether or not the studio is successful or not. So when you come out of it and you go to look for another job, you can say, here's what I was doing at that studio. Here's the impact I made at that studio. Um, unfortunately, that game got canned. Most of the time, um, it's budget that kills studios. Um, they just um, couldn't get the money together. Or worst case scenario is that the game didn't hit the things it was supposed to hit and the audience isn't quite there. Um, but for the most part, uh, in, in the indie space, there are all of these opportunities. So yeah, I've got... Um, that's uh, the studio is called Leda Entertainment. The game is called Brilliant, um, and that was one of my 
starting points. I also started my own studio almost immediately after I started, uh, after I found the industry, which is a position that not many people, I don't recommend, <laughs> weirdly enough. Um, I think a lot of people, um, and I've, I've done like a whole talk on this, but like a lot of people realize they can make a game and so think that they can start a studio and run a studio, but it's a completely different discipline managing something and uh, creating something are two separate things. You need mm. way, way. Luckily, you know, I dived in and I learned a lot along the way, and I managed to keep my head up above enough so I can continue to do it. But um, it's just not. <laughs> it's not great. Um, so, but yeah. So I initially worked on a project that was way too big uh, for my own studio, um, and then canned that within the first six months and dived into a smaller mobile game and managed to release that. So I had that under my belt. And then during lockdown, um, I teamed up with an animation studio and we made another mobile game um, to support the NHS. Um, so I had that going on. Um, I also was part of two or three other startups. <laughs> um that were trying to do things in the game space one of which um i was really interested in um and it was to do with helping people with alzheimer's through game technology um i had to leave that project because i swamped myself but um yeah so i literally was just doing grabbing i had a lot of eggs and a lot of baskets mm -hmm. um to the point where now um, I kind of still have just as many, but the ones that have dropped off have dropped off quite naturally, and I'm left with ones that have a uh, greater chance of success. And, and like I say, some some are already kind of uh, have that success on the horizon. How do you decide where, like, what to keep on with and, and what to drop? You obviously said about things that are successful, but you know, sometimes it's a passion project or it's something your friends are working on and, and you want to support. How do you make sure that you don't spread yourself too thin? I'm probably asking the wrong question because you are not good at doing that. But <laughs> Yeah, um, I, 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 I live on the edge of spreading myself too thin for sure. But, um, but I do still um, preen away along the way. Um, and mostly um, I kind of... I kind of keep a mix if I'm honest so I have like half of what I'm doing I'm doing more for the love than for the money and the other half I'm doing more because I feel like it will be financially viable in the long run and I think you do need that mix um, because one half is giving you way more pleasure creatively because you just have free reign and money isn't a worry and from what I've seen in the industry, in my time in the industry, a lot of the time the projects that do do really well are the ones that didn't worry so much about money early on, mm. that were really trying to enjoy themselves and make the best thing possible, that end up making the big money, really. Um, and then the ones that you do, like I also do um, consulting for small indie studios. Um, I've got one coming up in a couple of weeks. And... Um, and so there's some of that stuff that like can can pay on the side, but it's more about the money. Um, even though I love it because I'm helping other indies and other studios to potentially fulfil their dreams. I think that's a really good way to think about how you manage your projects. And I think I've done this without really thinking about it in the past as well. Is you you need to have a bit of both. You need to have things that you just love and are passionate about, whether that's helping your friends or doing something by yourself that's maybe not making money or not making money yet. But also, you know, unfortunately we do need to make money. And mm. I've definitely found that since I've been doing some more projects with, with you and the team is, even though I'm not super happy in my main corporate job that isn't quite in gaming yet, having these things on the side gives me much more motivation to... I guess just exist in the working world and like keep keep going and and also just gives me a lot more confidence that I will get that thing that I'm looking for. 
um, which has also changed over time. I, I used to want to work in events and I did some kind of side projects. I used to run a cosplay event and I ended up getting that experience. But when I was there, I was like, actually, this isn't, this isn't where I'm going. This isn't, you know, my future. And when you take on projects that are unpaid or aren't your full, I guess, salary job, you can step away and say, you know what, I've done that and I've got great experience and these are, this is what I've learned, but I'm going to go to that next thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think when you, when you're, when you're working a job that like you say is, um, is bringing in all the money there, you, you've tethered yourself to that job. Like mm -hmm. you need that job because otherwise you can't afford to live. Whereas if you're doing a couple of things that are making you money here and there, um, it is a lot easier to step away if you if you feel you need to yeah and I think I've been quite lucky I guess to to meet you and the GDL team and and the things we're working on because we get on very well and that's you know that's another big part of it it's not just me getting experience it's building a community and, and making friends as well mm -hmm. how have you found like the right people to work with in the past because you've obviously had loads of different projects and experiences how have you kind of made those connections and met those people um mostly through networking One, once i discovered networking i kind of fell in love with networking a little bit um which is why i do events obviously <laughs> but I, I do think part of that is um i'm not a natural extrovert um i am a natural introvert and events for me means that i'm bringing people to me i don't have to go to find them um so it's kind of a bit of a cheat um but i've i've also been trying to find the right people for like a really long time so when for yeah for 10 years at least um and when it comes to pulling together creative teams even longer but um you, i i basically learned on the job from um picking people meeting people talking to people having them come and work on a project with me um, and you just, I'd like to say that like you figure out um, things that you can spot and, and uh, but realistically, you just develop a gut feeling. Like uh, when you meet someone, um, you remember the things that you felt the last time you met someone who kind of had this same vibe. And so you know whether or not or you've got kind of like this inkling whether or not you should grab them and work on a project with them or whether you should just be like, uh, let's go to the next person. <laughs> um, but also now I spend more time networking and chatting to people before I start working with them mm -hmm. than I ever have before. Normally, like people could have met me once and they'd be working on a project with me, like if not the same day, then the following day. Whereas now I will meet someone and I'll be like, ah, oh, I think I think there might be opportunity to work with that person. And then I'll wait until like, I've spoken to them again or met them again. And whether that happens organically or whether I just think to myself, I'll follow up on it. And so like I arrange like a video call or whatever. Um, what are you looking and, for when you're having that kind of initial relationship building period with someone? um it's kind of I'm, I'm searching for a feeling of i think i can trust this person mm -hmm. is definitely one of the things um in fact i would say it's probably only really two core things one is do i feel i can trust this person and two do i feel this person has the passion and drive to go for what they want to go for because I've spoken to quite a few people who are like, this is what I want to do. This is my career goal. Um, and then when I put them on a project with me, they're not going and getting it. There's um, and not that it's like, it's not, it's never a bad thing to come and ask me questions like ever. But if, if I'm always chasing you and then when I get hold of you, you have a question for me, it's like you, should have come to me with that question, like because it's time wasted. Um, 
so yeah passion and drive it's actually how i recruited my uh, my pa I've, I've recently recruited a pa and i am over a period of working with them over what like two i think my it's been a very short period but like a, a number of weeks um it just went from um I know that I can trust this person. They demonstrate every time I speak to them that they have passion and they have drive. And um, we had a chat about um, this opportunity for, for working with me as my PA. Um, and yeah, it it just, it, it works because, because I've done that extra legwork. Because there are many people that I've met that I could have just said, let's, I've literally been looking for a PA for about a year. So it's taken me a long time to find someone. I think that's that's something that for anyone who's who's listening, I guess, who who does want to change careers or change industries, is that like we said earlier, you, you do have to just take some ownership of that and absolutely depend on your network and your community because otherwise what's the point of it? But if you don't put in the effort yourself, then you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna reach your goals if if you don't put yourself out there. And it is scary. And I think people need to realize that when we're doing experience based projects that you're in that role, because you maybe don't know everything. So you're not going to get it right every time you're not going to know everything. So think about the things that you do know and what you can do, but also lean on those people when you need to, like you said, if you have a question, if you're not really sure, then just come and ask. But otherwise, like, just go and try things and do it and see how it goes. Because otherwise, how will you learn? You have to do that yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah, I always appreciate it um, when someone comes to me with questions before they get going. Because I know that they're doing it so that they don't waste anyone's time. And it also shows me that they're, they're working, like they're trying to work already. Whereas if someone's silent for like a week and then I chase them because I haven't heard anything and they, if I'm lucky, they say, oh yeah, I've done all of this. <laughs> and I go, okay, you've just been working silently in the background. Fine. But most of the time, yeah, I, I chase them up and they're like, oh yeah, I haven't done anything yet. I didn't really know what did you want me to do with this and, and where should I, what should I do with that? And I'm like, you've, you've wasted a whole week, which, which like for them might not be too big a deal mm. but for, for me for, for the company like this a week is a huge waste <laughs> and I don't I don't I don't have time to chase people and and I shouldn't be chasing people it's for anyone listening it's funny to have this conversation because we obviously work together so I'm like <laughs> it's good to know I'll keep you a bit more up to date <laughs> Do you know what? I, I hadn't even thought of <laughs> What am I doing wrong, Natalie? Well, the, the, so, the thing, like, for people that don't know, yeah, we, um, we work together um, on, a, on a couple of projects, um, one of which being Game of London, Game of London, uh, and, the other <laughs> and the other being my studio, Fribbly Games. Um, and actually, you're, you're going to be doing some work with uh, Bullion as well, so... Um, yes. sharing the workload in 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 various places um but yeah i when i when i found you on linkedin i think the first thing i approached you about was podcasting right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um and then um from your side uh you did what i think is a really good thing for anyone to do who is trying to switch careers and, and stuff you you found yourself in a place amongst other professionals in a safe space where we had we already mentioned that we encourage people to say if they want to do other things let us know because we can try and help you out and that's like yeah that's what you did you, you posted one of the channels that you wanted to switch careers and do, do that move and it just so happened that I had these opportunities and so yeah when I see someone who is making that like I, w I want to do it like just give me an opportunity that's that's where all of those things start, I think. How do you go about making that transition in from transition from experience to paid work, whether it's 
kind of like you said you've we've worked on things that have just kind of naturally and organically turned into paid work but it might be that you know you're then going to move on to the next thing that might be a salaried or paid opportunity how do you make that how do you bridge that gap because it feels quite I guess it can feel quite big sometimes especially when you're doing quite a lot for for one one channel or one or one company what is the kind of process in your brain and then how do you execute making that jump um so well so there's there's one thing that um people always need to consider and that is it, it is kind of industry standard um whether we like it or not that uh when you start applying for jobs in the games industry the first the first barrier to entry that you will see is have you worked on a ship title getting three ship titles under your belt can be tricky like i say especially in the indie space where studios live and die you mm. could end up working on five games that die before you've worked on one that got shipped um having said that um i think because um some studios accept shipped as being like a demo release um so at that point you can say the game is out there people are playing it this is how well it did you know there are some statistics behind it and again like i say you 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 get to be able to you're able to say here's the impact that i had in the release of that game um so you need to keep in mind that yeah you're you're going to be up against people who have worked on ship titles um and possibly people that had more experience than you so at that point you need to figure out um what is your selling point like what what is it that's going to make you different from everyone else and sometimes that can actually be like that you've got a squiggly career and that you have this excess of experience in um in an adjacent industry um that is really powerful and useful for for the job you're going for um and so and things that you need to things that i would say you need to prepare for in the leap is that most indie studios and and game development projects are kind of easy going because the 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 risk is at the end of the day that the that the game just doesn't get out there whereas when you switch to like an a studio that is more established a studio that has maybe been around for i would say at least 2 years um they're expectations are going to be harder there um the the room for error or mistakes is going to, you're going to feel it a lot more um your immediate like supervisors and bosses and things might not be might not have the kind of time that you find um with studios that are trying to make it like i have a lot of time i don't have a lot of time but i make a lot of time for anyone who works with me because um we're all just trying to get to a, a point of stability so most of my team are aware that if they're having struggle with having a problem they can come to me they can talk to me about it and it'll all be fine like if someone says to me i need to take 2 weeks out because this is going on in my life um one i require that they tell me about it anyway so i can work around it but also i'm able to give them that flexibility whereas um yeah in a studio that is um already running and they're watching the numbers and um every minute has uh, a a very literal um monetary value to it they they're not going to feel as open and as friendly in those moments i i think that for the most case for most cases like bosses are they understand but they're definitely it's definitely because the boss feels it more it's more annoying for them and so that's going to come through you're going to feel that whether whether they're trying to be cool about it or not you're going to feel it so the expectations change quite a bit when you switch from light and fairy indie space to something a bit more corporate especially if the indie studio um not only is trying to make games for themselves but they outsource if they're working for clients then 
then there's a real serious uh, edge to it. I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier that the, you, you need balance all the time. So if you do then make that transition into something that is paid and you are working for someone who does need to make money and ship games, like you said, day by day, every area thinks important to make sure that maybe then you pick up another project that is free again or think about something that that you can do for yourself as well because there is a lot of added pressure that comes with actually kind of I guess working for someone as opposed to volunteering for someone um and again that's down to you to manage you know you have if 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 that's the goal if making money through something is your goal then that is something for you to manage and balance and that again that might just mean taking on extra work or doing things that aren't quite as fun, but also has a different outcome. Mm. And that's, I think when you get to that point and when I get to that point, I'm going to have to think about reevaluating my next goal. Um, I think that's something that we forget to do a lot and personal development has always been really important to me. And I try to actually look at my personal development goals every six months. So when I do ultimately get to that place, it will be really important for me to say, I'm here now. So what, what's next? Mm. I'm finding just, that no, next thing. I don't do enough of that. If I'm honest, the, the whole, like, I, I just, I aim for goals. And then when I get there, I just go next goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I very, I very rarely get time to be like, okay, that, you know, that was, here's how I did it with that. Like, here's what I might want to change on my road to the next one. I just kind of, I think once you're there as well you've had all this time and you've been working really hard and you're finally there then you're just swamped with this new thing learning you know a new game a new company new people a new boss a a new Mm. location possibly that you forget to actually celebrate what you've done there's this quote about you know look back from two years ago and realize where you are now and we're I think just as as a people in in a very I guess, corporate and capitalist world that we're just like, okay, done, done that one. What's the next? Like, what, how do I make more money? How do I do this? How do I do bigger yeah. things? Whereas actually it's a really big accomplishment to, to hit that goal, even if it doesn't feel like it as you move forward. Yeah. Like Game Dev London has been going for three years now and um, we, we kind of, took a moment to celebrate like we did a, well we worked we, we created an extra uh, special podcast episode to celebrate. <laughs> um but i think i mean we've well we've got um develop brighton coming up and we've i think the social uh the, the company social that we will have there should be a moment for us all to kind of just be like celebrating and enjoying the fact that it's been three years we do so much and um and we're planning to do more so it's kind of cool yeah I think I think it is important to to make sure you're always looking back as well and just even for the sake of moving forward to think about your transferable skills I think we kind of see a job description sometimes and think "Mm, I haven't done any of these things directly but if you actually think about it you you probably have done things that you can relate so I used to run hotels I was an ops manager um I had like 25 team members and then when I was applying for jobs in marketing and they were saying you know there's loads of people to manage and I was like I've done that not in the same way I don't have stakeholders in finance but I do have 25 people of different ages ethnicities backgrounds that I manage every day so I already have that skill it just looks a bit different and Mm. I think the power in squiggly careers is that you can collect these little nuggets of knowledge and information and skill that to someone I guess to the untrained eye might not be what they're looking for but when you can put it into context which is another skill to be able to do you actually probably have everything they need that you just have a slightly different version of it Mm. yeah for sure I think I had um well yeah like like I was saying before when I decided I was going to start my own studio I could have looked at that and gone I've never done that before 
and part of me did <laughs> very small very small part of me <laughs> but but mostly the other I was overwhelmed by this sense of I've managed creative teams before. Game development is just another creative team. Um, I've at, at the point at which I was trying to form a team, I had worked on every part of the creative pipeline from uh, concept, prototype, design, right through to shipping the uh, shipping the game. And I did that with just me and one other guy. <clears throat> so there was this part of me that was like yeah I haven't run my own studio before but I feel like I've got enough of the things to understand I, that I understood enough of the things that I could make that work yeah and again that fear is good that unknown and change is good and I say that as someone who hates change and the fear of the unknown is terrifies me but you you sometimes just have to try and put yourself out there and I think a lot of the time as well actually asking to be a part of something is usually it I think it's rare that it comes back with rejection because not everyone is doing it not everyone is actually going out there and asking so if you're the person who's like you know what I'm just going to go and do this it, it feels very scary and it feels like you're going to fail because we just kind of always think that it, it's not going to work because we don't know it, but actually you're, you're one in, not in a million, but you're one in less people than the people who are just wanting it. If mm. you're actually going and getting it, you're actually a rare person within that, within that pond, I guess. Yeah. You have to put, the, you have to put the feelers out there. You have to, um, like you were saying before, if you, if you want to be part of like the game, game development, especially and indie development even more so has a community and it doesn't just have like there's a there's a large london community there's a large brighton community like there's game development communities all over the uk and globally for that matter but um so if you want to be part of the industry and you're not trying to get to know the community you're going to struggle to get into the industry because nine times out of 10, I would say, which is just one of those statistics everyone throws around, I guess, but like um, most of the people that I know, that I speak to on a regular basis, and because I network, I speak to a lot of people, they got their start or they got where they are right now because they were part of this community. They spoke to this person. And normally it's just a casual conversation as well. It's just like, oh, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. What are you working on? I'm not working on anything. I'm looking to like get into this. And that person will either go, oh, we're looking for someone to do that. Or, oh, I just spoke to someone who's looking for someone to do that. And then they, they have that conversation. And then that's, yeah, that's how they, they started. Um, and the other part of that is that Recruitment for those of us who run studios is really tiresome and boring and dull. <laughs> like sit, like doing video call interviews. Um, and I speak as someone who has done uh, 20 interviews back to back over two days. I, like I interviewed 20 people. Yeah, <laughs> I interviewed 20 people. Um, it was because I had a recruitment crisis, but so it's not like something that always happens. But um, at the end of that, not only could I barely tell you the difference between each person and their faces? But I, I had to seriously go through my notes and try and pull out the moments for the people that stood out. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard in a video call interview or even in a like face to face interview to stand out when there's this like face, face, face situation going on. Whereas in a relaxed networking environment, you have so much more time to make an impression. There's not this like, um, like all of my best interviews where I've gone for a job have been where we both forgot it was a job interview and we've run beyond the time that was allocated. That happens naturally out in a networking environment. You, you haven't got to leave immediately. And also if it feels a bit awkward or janky, you can leave immediately. <laughs> you could just be like, I'm really sorry, I just need to go to the toilet or, or whatever your getaway is. So there's this much more relaxed environment and yeah so 
my recruitment process now is a lot more through people that I've met than through the laborious task of trying to post on social media that we have a position and go through however many people apply for it. And and the other thing about that is, um, and it might just be a case for me that I'm in a lucky position that, for example, when we um, try to recruit new podcast hosts, because that's like my job, um, we do get a lot of people that want to do it. And I, the majority of the people that I meet and I speak to, I would love to bring them all on as hosts. I'm like, oh, you'd be great. Oh, you'd be great. <laughs> and when you've when you've done like eight of those, and you're like, oh, I could, I, I would love to like just hire all of those people. Um, and you then have to pick someone. And you, what you try and do is keep the other people like on a in in the back of your mind or whatever mm-hmm. for, for later spaces but the reality of it is that that doesn't especially when you're relying on memory it doesn't always happen so um so i i find it better for me in both ways that i can do it through networking rather than have to let down like any number of people <laughs> yeah and i think again that's that's on the person who's interviewing or trying to get there to make sure that if it's not right in that situation that they keep in touch or they understand you know why why weren't why not me what you know, what can I do and, and keep listening keep learning and maybe it's not right right now but in a few months or in a year maybe it's time to to come back together so keeping those connections I think is really important even if it doesn't it doesn't work out yeah um so folks be brave and network (laughs) and take on projects but not too much but sometimes more than you think (laughs) we don't have solid advice here (laughs) what is the solid line uh take on lots of projects but not too many but quite a lot but but make sure you you're free to let them go but don't let them all go (laughs) no it's, it's a balancing act at the end of the day and you um i think you do get like a gut feeling for it mm. um i definitely do because i've just been doing it for so long um there are there are like even recently i've had a couple of people approach me who are like i really would like you to work on this project and i've said yes to one of them because the other one i've worked on enough projects that i just don't think it's got legs and I, I always I always tell people that I'm like I'm, I'm not on board right now and I can tell them why I can say like because in my experience you're going to need this this and this if this project is going to survive and, and make it all the way I don't just go sorry no bye <laughs> and, and leave them to potentially think um, but yeah I think um, that I think that's also why it's useful to network because you get to speak to people and you'll hear about their projects and you'll see whether or not those projects lived or died. And so you kind of get an outside sense of the kind of projects that you want to get involved in. I yeah, think I anything think... that's close to demo is probably a good safe bet. You you made a good comment earlier. I tried to write it down, but I can't read my hand right. Think about basically if you if you want to be in the industry but you're not being part of the community, then you are going to struggle. And, you know, like you said, just being aware of what's happening, this project didn't quite work or this one did, whether you're involved or not, just being aware of what's happening around you and success stories, not so success stories, what people are doing, new things and innovations, or, you know, people who are just doing the basics really well. If you're not involved in the community and putting yourself out there and networking and being involved, then, you're not going to be as ready yourself to kind of then go and execute things. Um, yeah. Especially like you said, if you're, if you're trying to build your own game, develop your own game or your own studio, or just putting yourself out there to be part of one, you have to have a bit of awareness of, of what everyone else is doing. That's part of, that's part of being a gamer and being in the industry is, is the community. Yeah. Yeah, and like being, it's the same with like any 
any job really like being aware of what is going on in the industry it it means that you're aware whether or not you're safe like whether or not uh, um, some big impact is coming into the industry that is going to take out half of the indie studios or or even on the flip side like there's a lot of um government funding that's coming up right now there's a lot in fact there's a lot of uh, investment in the uk um i'm about to try and apply for some um that i wouldn't have known about if i had have just been like um yeah not not listening out to it not talking to people not not getting involved um and a lot of that does come from from networking i'm i'm literally like the biggest proponent of, <laughs> of networking <laughs> not that you would know <laughs> Game but, it, who? <laughs> but it is it is just so vital as i would say especially in the games industry um i i know that it it happens quite a bit in other industries um i think the only other industry where it's pro- possibly quite as big is the finance industry we have like a lot of um programmers that come over from finance and they get it straight away um they dive straight into networking like like it's just absolutely normal another transferable skill Mm -hmm. we love it a lot of a lot of guys who come out of um out of finance weirdly enough are they're in they're programming for jobs that are really well paid and then uh I've met so many of them now and they're like, yeah, I ditched like a really well-paying, high, um, high intensity kind of job role to step into the games industry because I thought I can program games. I'd like to do something that's fun. They soon find that like fun is, <laughs> is, a, is a limiting. Yeah, there, there's still a headache, but it's definitely... For them, anyway, it's definitely more rewarding than working for a big finance corporate where they're just trying to squeeze more money out of something and normally in like a really horrible way. Yeah, but it's still a job. Yeah, a job that they leave. (laughs) (laughs) With that, I think I'll conclude today's episode. That was a good run. Uh, We've been your hosts, Roxanne Marshall and Stuart Deville. Um, hope you enjoyed today's squiggly episode about squiggly careers <laughs> and for anyone who's trying to do what what we've done and we're doing best of luck to you um, join and the Game Dev London community absolutely go do that and make some friends make some connections and go get those goals and if you want to find us, you can just go to gamedev.london. That's the website. That's where the links to everything are there pretty much. But if you want to join the Discord community, gamedev.london forward slash join, that'll take you straight in. And you can you can talk about, uh, you can start up conversations about the stuff we've talked about today if you want to jump into that kind of conversation. Or you can just jump in with any conversation because that's what we're all doing over there. We're all talking about game development. We, not, we might not respond because we're doing 10 projects at a time. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, we'll do our best. <laughs> Me and Roxanne might not jump in immediately. But... <laughs> at some point, maybe next yeah. week. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for joining and catch us again, same time next week, Monday. And um, we'll chat soon. <laughs>